Hello, and welcome back to Educator.com, AP World History. I'm glad you're here, hope you're well, ready to attack this great course. We're talking about some of the important aspects of AP World History, and one of those are the themes. And so we're going to look at some, uh, some of those themes right now. Okay, so first of all, how is AP World History a little different maybe than other history courses you have taken? What is it about? First of all, it's about interaction among peoples. It's a world history. It's not American history. It's not Vietnamese history. It's not French history. It's not Chinese history. It's an attempt to back up from those things and look at the whole world. And when we do that, we can't really have world history, in a sense, until people start interacting with each other all over the world. Now, that's going to take a bit of time because we're going to develop some classic civilizations, classic ways to see the world that happen in somewhat of... Uh, by themselves, away from others, and then that interaction comes. So we have to know what those are before they interact, in other words, to understand it. But the heart of it is that interaction. And we use comparison a lot. That's world history. That's kind of a lot of stuff. So one of the ways to cut down on how we learn it is by comparing one group of people to another group of people, thereby learning both of them at the same time. It's about change and continuity over time. And continuity is that difficult one that while lots of things change, there's a lot that remains very similar. And we need to see that as well as change. And we have to see how it develops over time. And one of the most important parts of this course is thinking skills, historical thinking skills. We're going to talk about those a little later, but the idea is so fresh among uh, educators of today that we've been too lax in American education helping students to think rather than to memorize. And also really important right now is evidence-based communication. We need you to have a point, have developed some uh, idea, some notion, some uh, connection, and say, this is the way things are. Now, I don't just say that. I back it up with facts, with evidence, and to be able to talk like that. And I'm not talking about like a lawyer's skill or a debater's skill where your only goal is to uh, make your point clear and get it across. This is also what politicians do. Rather, it's to be more of a thinker and say, well, what are the problems with this idea? I got to deal with them. And do they change my mind? What is, how do I get to what's the more truth out of this than just believing something because I believe it? And if we're going to understand other people, we need to understand them in their own terms instead of our terms. And this is really difficult. Uh, I think it's an interpersonal skill, too, that you just have with your friends, that people are different from each other. And when you begin to understand that other person from their point of view, then you begin to really understand that person instead of just saying, this person is just like me and they did this because that, and so forth. No, let's take it from their point of view. So we try to do that in world history. We don't try to come at it from one point of view and understand everything centered around that. What do those people in India think? What do they do? What does this mean to them? How do they express something, okay? What does it mean to them? Let's learn it that way rather than uh, filtering it through our own. 
and we're going to try to ride the fine line between content and skills. Content is the facts of history, the stuff in your textbook. Skills are the way you manipulate that information to make meaning. The thinking skills, okay? And uh, we're putting an emphasis in American education over the last few years and going forward on the skills rather than the content. Because if we ask you five years from now something about world history, you will have forgotten a lot of the facts and you might even get some all messed up. But if you have the skills of thinking, you can take new information and use it in very positive and good ways. And this is what we want you to be able to do. The skills don't go away. It's important for you to know that the AP uh, people have redesigned all of their history courses. Um, uh, European history, world history, and U.S. history. And they're trying to say, let's not make people memorize huge amounts of information which they'll soon forget, but let's put it on learning and using historical thinking skills. Become like the person who wrote the textbook rather than being the textbook is history. The textbook is not history. History is an ever-changing, evolving thing. The past, what happened in the past doesn't change. How we interpret it does. And we need to understand that and deal with it. So, if you're a good memorizer but not a good thinker, this is a great course for you to get that skill that you need. If you're a great thinker but you have problems with memorization, woohoo! Life is going to be better. So, the encouragement is to dig deep in some areas instead of knowing a little about a lot. Let's know a lot about some points in history. The encouragement by the AP College Board is to do that. And then all the courses are going to be <clears throat> aligned in the same way. So that when you take, when you do an essay in world history, you won't go to your American, your U.S. history AP and say, which we used to say, forget all that stuff you learned in world history about the essays. That's all, no, that's not the way we do it here. They will be all the same. And this is good for you, so that when you move from one course to the other, you already have a lot of the pieces put together. The same thinking skills, uh, the same way of approaching things, the same kind of exam. So, one of those things that's common to all the history courses is theme. There are themes in history. So, what the heck? What? is a theme. Well, a theme is something that permeates the whole. So that it, let's take your textbook for instance. If you turn to any page, randomly turn to a page, the themes will be, themes, one or more themes will be on that page, no matter what page you turn to. Because it's in the whole. It's not in just one part. It's something that gets repeated. It might fall off and not, you might not be very strong at some point and then come back and be really strong in another part, okay? So it definitely will be repeated throughout history. Your history course, this theme will come up. And it's something that ties the larger work together. So uh, theme says, if we understand the theme, then we can see history as one piece because the theme runs through everything. It ties it together. And here's the hard part. It's more implicit than explicit. So what does that mean? Explicit is something on the surface. You can see it. It's shouting at you. Uh, you know what it is. You can't avoid it. 
Implicit is something that's there and very important, but it may be in the background. Maybe it's the music and not the action. But the music's really important because it's, it's governing your feelings about what's going on. So implicit is background. It's uh, something that's really important, but it's a lot harder to get to because we tend to not see it. It's like you can go to a movie and you might not even know that the music is playing, that there's music in different parts of it. You'd know it if it weren't there. But since it is there, it kind of fits into the background rather than, and at the same time, that music is manipulating your feelings. So we know the themes are more on the implicit side of things. So how do we get these themes? We get these themes because historians listen to the data of history. They propose that something is a theme. Other historians debate whether or not that's a true theme. And then it come to, well, for now, this will be what we think is a theme. But that is always open to revision. Repeat. Okay, so we're always looking at these themes and judging them as to be, well, no, we need to add this theme or make this one more important and this one less important or take it off the list and so forth. So here's an example. How do you know a dog when you see one? What is dogginess? Is it the ears? Well, no, because, you know, dogs have many different kinds of ears. Is it the snout? They have snout. Well, some of them have smashed in noses and others have very long noses. Is it the color? Oh, no. There's lots of different colors. Is it size? Oh, no. There are dogs this big and dogs this big. Okay. How do you know it's a dog then? Well, there's something like dogginess. And they're not obvious. They're not that nose or those feet. They're in the background and they define it. So that's what a theme is like. Now, is there an overriding theme? Is there one theme to world history that we can say, this is what world history is all about and it happens from the beginning to the end? Is there an overriding theme? Well, one question is, did history start someplace and is it going someplace? It starts with, um, let's say, we talk about technology. The story of, of history is a story of technology and how small technologies build on each other and that changes the world. And so technology is uh, the overall theme. Or is it warfare? Well, those are questions. Are things getting better and better? So we see the beginning, things are kind of terrible. Uh, people are killing each other and for no good reason. And uh, governments are uh, authoritarian. And as we move further, we get to democracy and people are much better off. Things are getting better and better. Technology is getting better and better. That's the, is that the story of history? Or is it the opposite? Things used to be fantastic. It's a great, you know, like Eden, where everything is wonderful and beautiful, and we've just gotten terribler and terribler, if that's a word, since then. Is it getting worse and worse until we just kill each other off? Well, those are possibilities, but most world historians are leery. We don't like these grand explanations of all of world history because mostly they're proposed by people with an agenda, a religious agenda, a power agenda, a theoretical agenda. And most of the time they're not right. So let's just not 
Let's not look for that grand theme that explains everything. I think if there is an overarching theme in world history, it is more and more interaction. That the world becomes more interactive with its all of the peoples as time goes on. So, what are the themes? Well, theme number one is humans in interact with the environment. Well, duh, who doesn't know that? Well, let's look at it more carefully. First of all, demography and disease. Demography, there's a word, huh? Uh, demography is the study of human statistics, you know, birth rates, death rates, where people live, um, what, their, what their occupations are, uh, okay, those kinds of things. Income statistics, how many people, so forth. All right, so that's demography. So part of what we do in world history is look at some of those things. Those things are important. What about disease? Come on, who cares about disease? What's that all about? But especially epidemics, they affect people. You will study about the plague and how that changed the world. And smallpox changed the world and Spanish flu changed the world. These were important things that happened and they're not connected to governments, so to speak, okay? In fact, world history um, kind of began with a, a historian by the name of William McNeil, and uh, one of his books was of plagues and people, explaining how plagues moved history more than people moved history. And uh, this was quite a quite a significant event in thinking in a, in a world history aspect rather than the history of my country. Okay, demography and disease, how about migration? Well, there's people all over the world in every little nook and cranny. How'd they get there? How'd that happen? Well, there have been a number of migrations and movements of people. And we need to look at those movements of people. We assume from the scientific data that perhaps humans originated somewhere in East Africa. But from there, they got to every place on Earth. And how did that happen? That's a good question, right? That's world history. We also look at patterns of settlement. When people do decide on a place to live, what different patterns do they establish to have a community? And technology is very important in this. A new technology is gonna mean something uh, good for those people usually who have it. Here's a, and we usually take, think of technology as a, electronic things and so forth, but uh, simple things like the stirrup uh, changed the world. And those who had it were able to conquer and do more than those that didn't. And of course, technology can't be hidden forever and kept to one group, but that initial uh, development was a huge thing. Theme number two development and interaction of cultures. I put three photos here of three different uh, kind of uh, cultures. Here we may have a like a business culture, a couple of uh, lawyers maybe. Here we have uh, uh, a guy out surfing and there's a surf culture and here we have football. Now, you know from knowing just these kind of uh, microcultures within our own culture, you know that there's people who surf, have a certain way of talking, certain way of acting and, and approaching life. And you know 
that business people with their suits and ties going to the high rises have their kind of uh, lifestyle. And football players, we, we read more and more about these football players and the way their lifestyles are and how they think about life. What if one of these guys is a surfer and one of these guys is a football player? Then as they work together, they bring these different, there's going to be some interaction of these cultures together. Now, take that and spread it out to a worldwide kind of thing, and that's the, a part of theme two. And one aspect is religions. And here's a collage of religious uh, photos, and you can see the great variety of practices and beliefs that people have in their religions. This is part of world history to understand those strong beliefs and uh, ways of living. We also have belief systems, philosophies, and ideologies. These are kind of like religion, but they don't have the God aspect to them. Confucianism, you know, a good third of the world is affected by Confucian thinking. Uh, what is that kind of thinking? How does it affect the way people are? Individualism is the, you know, here's the East and here's the West. And those philosophies that they live by, that, that's not something that they know that they're thinking about and doing. It's just something their culture has given to them. But then they interact. Science, you know, science comes along and there's a particular way of thinking and doing about science. Socialism, a reaction to capitalism and, and develops a whole system of uh, thinking and action. And one of those, of course, is communism. Uh, which uh, is a whole philosophy of way things ought to be, all right? That's not technically religious. Theme three, state building, expansion, and conflict. This is kind of what most of you think of, or think of history, or we're gonna study about uh, building the nation, having wars, uh, how this one group expands and so forth. Uh, and uh, so this is a part of world history. It's not, we're not saying that it's not. So we're going to look at political structures and forms of government. We're going to look at empires. And uh, then after the empires kind of fall away, we end up with nations and nationalism. And then there are revolts and revolutions. Revolutions. And then as we move really into the modern period, we have regional, trans-regional, or inter-regional, and global structures and organizations, not bigger than a nation. And an example of that would be like the United Nations, uh, um, a gathering of most of the, almost all of the nations of the world in one place to promote peace and prosperity among all the nations. Um, and how that fits in with nations is, you know, is always a little bit of a, how, do you, how does that work? Um, how, how are we a nation and how are we a citizen of the world? But the fact that these things exist, you see, is a development in world history. So we've covered interaction between humans and the environment, theme number one. Theme number two, development and interaction of cultures. And three, state building and expansion and conflict. What we're going to do in the next session is cover these two, creation, expansion, and interaction of economic systems. 
and number five, development and transformation of social structures. So we will do those two in our next session. And it's been a delight for me to be here with you and to try to tell you what a great course and how helpful AP World History can be to your way of thinking and uh, to your knowledge of other people. It's going to be great. All right. Thanks for being here at educator.com. Hope to see you.